Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so today we're going to get started with the urinary system. So you will be watching this video on Wednesday during bioadvising day. And then on Friday, we'll be talking about uh, some more about our respiratory system. So we'll jump around a little bit, but I think the anatomy of the urinary system uh, is something that you should be able to get a little bit of a handle on yourselves better than asking you to learn about hemoglobin on your own. So that's what we're going to do for today. Okay. So we're talking about the urinary system. So I want to orient us first. Okay. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about the functions a little bit, uh, but mainly about the components of the urinary system. We're also going to talk about something called the micturition reflex and how you control it. Basically peeing. Okay. So here's our orientation. Okay. So we're starting in the body and here we can see the urinary system highlighted. So here we have the kidney. Here we have the ureter. So that's the long tube we see here descending into the pelvis. And here we see the bladder. Now sitting on top of the kidney, we see a structure that's not technically part of the urinary system, but I do want you to know it's there. Okay. So here we see our super renal or adrenal glands, which we've talked about as we talked about uh, our sympathetic nervous system and as we were talking about our endocrine system. So they're called suprarenal because we'll see this word renal a lot throughout our slides today and ongoing. Renal means kidney. So suprarenal, superior to the renal system. All right. So moving in a little bit, so we're gonna zoom in on a kidney, okay? Right, so zooming in on a kidney, duh, 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 you're gonna see a structure like this. So we sliced it in half. You can see the ureter coming down. You can see the blood flow going in. So you can see that it has this structure of tubes and pyramids and a kind of outer shell. Okay. So here we see the renal artery sitting in front, right? Going in, in red. Here we see the renal vein, going behind. So they're going to an area called the helum of the kidney. So that's just the central portion. Okay. And then we can see this outer shell called the renal cortex. Okay. So pay attention here because we are going to be looking at structures that dive between the renal cortex and our next structure, the renal medulla. Okay. So the renal medulla and the renal cortex are going to be separate structures. And we're going to see things that transition between the two. So basically they're different types of tissue essentially, and they're gonna have different properties. Okay. So the renal medulla is going to be shaped like a bunch of pyramids. So here we see a renal pyramid outlined. Okay. And between these pyramids, we can see renal columns. So that's a bit more of the gross anatomy, the larger anatomy that we'd be looking at. This controller out of the way. All right, so moving forward, we're gonna talk about basically some microanatomy. So something a lot smaller than what you'll see in lab. So we're still in the kidney. We're gonna zoom in even further. So we're gonna zoom in on this little slice that takes us to part of the cortex and part of the renal medulla here, okay? So we got our cortex, we got our medulla. Okay. So this is what it's gonna look like on the left on the cartoon. Uh, so here we can see cortex descending into the medulla here, okay? Now, within this structure, we're going to have something called a nephron. So that is what's highlighted here uh, in colors. So you can see some arterial flow going into, on this image, this blue blob. You can then see a series of twisting tubes leading down into this sort of hairpin turn, looks kind of like a bobby pin, right? And we keep going up. We have another twisty bit back in the cortex. And then we dump into what we're gonna call our collecting ducts. It's nice and yellow, because this is really when we're gonna have urine formed, okay? Here you can see the arrangement of this structure relative to some of our blood flow. So as we're going through, the purpose of the kidneys is really to filter your blood kind of. Um, so we're gonna be controlling 
the contents of your blood. We're going to be controlling the volume of your blood with our renal system, with our kidneys. Uh, so we're going to have a close association between the nephron, the structure we're looking at, and the blood flow in the kidney. So here you can see arteries going in and they're all swirled around these structures. They're swirled around this tube system, including all the way down and around that turn, okay? And then our venous flow is also surrounding this structure. So we're gonna have the ability for things to move from these tubes, the nephron, into the blood and vice versa. Okay. So we're gonna talk about the larger blood supply and then get down to that micro blood supply, okay? So we have unfiltered blood coming in through the artery or renal artery. So our renal artery is the first part. I'm gonna put a little blood cell on. I tried to do some animations to make this a little more fun for us. Okay, so we're starting with our blood in the renal arteries, okay? Now we're traveling through the renal artery. Next, we're gonna go through segmental arteries. So there are segments to your kidneys. So we're traveling through a segmental artery. Next, we can also think of the kidney as having smaller lobes. So we're gonna have interlobar arteries. So we're traveling down one of those now. So you can see it going along like the edge of one of those renal pyramids. Then we have our arcuate arteries, arc, think like the shape, like an arc, like a curve. So we see those arcuate arteries curling around. We're going like that. And next we have our cortical radiate arteries. Uh, so radiate, think radiating out like rays of sunshine, cortical because this is the cortex. So we're just gonna move a little bit out. Okay, that takes us to the structures that are gonna surround our nephron. So these are gonna be the really important ones for our lecture purposes, okay? So we're gonna have our afferent arterioles. Remember from our nervous system, afferent means going to something. A-E means to, sorry. Afferent means to. Efferent is gonna mean away. So we have our afferent arteriole going to the nephron. Then we're gonna have a capillary bed specialized called the glomerulus. So we'll have our glomerular capillaries. This is where we are going to drop off uh, waste along with really most of the things that are in our plasma except for proteins and blood cells into the nephrons. So this is beginning our process of filtering the blood. Okay? And then eventually we will trace back. Okay, so this list is just showing you again, the big structures. So like gross anatomy stuff you can potentially see. Now we're gonna run through the structures that are surrounding the nephron, okay? So we got our blood cell sitting there in the cortex, the end of those cortical radiate arteries, okay? Oop, oh, it's moving. Let me get on our nephron. Okay, sorry about those movements there. Okay. So here we see this blood cell sitting in the afferent arterial. It would then swirl around these structures, the glomerular capillaries, okay? Dropping off plasma, filtering out the blood into the nephron. Then it is going to travel through the rest of this artery, which is now gonna be the efferent or away artery along what we're gonna call peritubular uh, capillaries. So these peritubular structures are going along, okay? And then we're gonna enter the venous system, okay? So after the waste is dropped off, it's going through the efferent arterial. There we go, that's where the motion should be, efferent arterial. Peritubular capillaries are these parts sitting along our tubules. Next, the structure that's mostly straight up and down are our vasa recta capillaries. Recta, rect, rectus, erect, all means up and down. Vasa recta, vasa for vasculature, recta for straight, okay? So vasa recta capillaries, okay? 
led us into our venous system. So we'd have an interlobular vein then, okay. arcuate veins, interlobar veins, just tracing everything back basically, renal vein, back to our inferior vena cava, going back to the heart. Okay, so that's our blood supply. And for the purposes of this unit and our physiology lecture portion, we're going to be thinking mainly about these structures along the nephron. So the afferent arterial going to the glomerular capillaries sitting inside essentially this cup, efferent arterial going away, peritubular capillaries sitting along our tubules. And then we want to know that we have the vasorecta around this loop turn structure, which we're going to call the loop of Henley as we move forward. Okay. So that's our nephron. See all that blood flow going along. And now I got a little yellow triangle for you here. That little yellow triangle is what we're going to be tracing through the rest of our nephron. So what this is representing is the plasma that we're filtering into the series of tubes called the nephron that is eventually going to become urine, okay? We're gonna see a lot of things going into this fluid. We're gonna see a lot of things coming out of this fluid, but eventually when it's fully formed, it's urine, okay? So it's gonna travel through our nephron in a series of steps, okay? Before we talk about the segments of the nephron, I wanna get a little basic terminology first, um, so that as we walk through the different pieces, you can start to layer on what processes we're gonna be thinking about in those regions, okay? So we've talked about filtration before, like when we were talking about net filtration pressures, uh, when we were talking about our cardiovascular system, and specifically about our capillaries, okay? So hopefully it's not a surprise that glomerular filtration is gonna be movement of stuff from the blood, out of the blood. In this case, we're gonna go into the nephron. So the glomerulus, the structure is a modified capillary bed. And when we have fluid really moving from the blood out to our nephron, that's filtration, okay? Next, as we move through the nephron, we will have some things that were filtered out, right? So moved into the nephron from the blood and then get reabsorbed by the body. So reabsorption is going to be movement to the blood, right? So when we talked about net filtration pressure, we just talked about absorption. This is reabsorption in the kidney because first we filtered, now we're going to the blood. So reabsorption, movement from the tubules in the nephron back to the blood. And usually this is gonna be our paratubular capillaries. Okay. Those are those capillaries, the blood flow lying along our nephron. We'll also sometimes have secretion. So secretion is going to be movement of materials from the blood in the paratubular capillaries to the tubules. Um, so this is not usually really going to be describing fluid. This is going to be describing uh, like different types of ions potentially. Okay. So secreting is going to be something that's coming from the blood, moving into the tubules further along in the process than the filtration. So filtration is first. If it happens later on, it's secretion. And then excretion is going to be movement of this fluid that we're modifying out of the body. So excretion is basically peeing for the purposes of our kidney, okay? All right, so we're starting at the beginning of our nephron. So we can see that highlighted here on this image. So I'm gonna have everything else grayed out in color is what we're following. So we're starting with something called the renal corpuscle, okay? So the renal corpuscle is going to include our blood flow coming in, and then this sort of head of the nephron uh, surrounding that blood. So first we can see our afferent arterial up here at the top, okay? So we're gonna have blood flowing through the afferent arterial and into our glomerulus, 
So this swirling bit is the glomerulus, it's a modified capillary bed. Okay. So the glomerulus, the purpose of it is for filtration to happen. So we're going to form filtrate by moving the fluid of the plasma, as well as most of its contents, just not red blood cells, not uh, proteins, okay? We're moving fluid from the glomerulus into this region we call Bowman's capsule, okay? So Bowman's capsule is basically like our catcher's mitt for the filtrate for this fluid. So this space is Bowman's capsule, okay? Our blood continues along and leaves the glomerulus as well. After it leaves the glomerulus, that's called the efferent arterial, okay? So blood came in through the afferent arterial, went through the glomerulus, fluid was filtered out of the glomerular capillaries or the glomerulus into Bowman's space, which is just this space inside Bowman's capsule. And then the blood continued to flow out through the efferent arterial. Notice it's still red. So this is what's going to lead us into our paratubular capillaries, okay? So this structure, and especially this glomerulus plus Bloman's capsule arrangement is our renal corpuscle. Our fluid, our filtrate, is then going to continue down through the rest of the nephron, okay? So the next part of the nephron is something called the proximal tubule or the proximal convoluted tubule. Those terms are gonna be equivalent, okay? So we're moving from the renal corpuscle into this twisty part. So that's why we would sometimes say convoluted, convoluted meaning twisty, okay? So that little yellow piece, right? Let's click on again, all right? So we're zooming in on the proximal tubule. You see that yellow triangle representing our filtrate moving through the proximal tubule, okay? So in the proximal tubule, we're gonna have a lot of reabsorption happening. So we filtered most of our plasma from the glomerular capillaries into Bowman's space, Bowman's capsule. We now call it filtrate. It moves through our tubules, specifically through the proximal tubule first. Remember anatomy, proximal means nearer to your body. In this case, nearer to the beginning of our nephron, okay? So we're now gonna reabsorb some of that stuff. So we actually took more stuff out of the blood than we wanted to. So we're moving some of that stuff back into our paratubular capillaries in the proximal tubule. We are also going to be secreting some things into the proximal tubule. So we have a couple things that we are going to move additionally from our blood into this filtrate inside the proximal tubule, okay? Then we are going to continue down into a loop. So we can see this loop that's gonna be descending down into the medulla, okay? So this is called the loop of Henle or the nephron loop. So it's located in the medulla, so inside those renal pyramids, okay? And its purpose is uh, really to concentrate that filtrate into urine largely. This process is going to continue um, in some of these more distal structures. So some of our continuing structures, um, but a lot of it is happening in the loop of Henle. And we're going to be creating this very uh, sort of salty environment in our medulla. So basically the fluid, the interstitial fluid in the medulla and in the cortex is going to be different because of this loop of Henle. Okay. So first, we're gonna have a descending limb. So the colors match blue and blue here, okay? So we're going to go down through our descending limb first, down descending, okay? Moving down through it, okay? In this descending limb, we're going to be reabsorbing a bunch of water, okay? So we're reabsorbing a bunch of water. So that's this concentrating of the filtrate. Right, we're concentrating it, we're making it more salty, essentially, right? So we're leaving ions, but reabsorbing water. So we can see all that water coming out as we descend through the nephron loop. And then in the ascending limb, going back up, we're gonna have something else happening. This ascending limb, what's going on is that we're gonna be actively pumping out ions. So in the ascending limb, 
we're not doing water stuff anymore. It's impermeable to water. What we are doing is pumping out ions, specifically sodium and chloride, to make the medulla salty. So the fact that the medulla is salty is ultimately going to drive our water reabsorption. So that's all going to be due to the ascending limb and its active pumping of sodium and chloride, largely, okay? So when I say the medulla is salty, that's what I mean, because NaCl is table salt, sodium chloride, okay? We'll talk about this process in detail as we talk about the physiology of the kidney. But moving forward, because we're just trying to get a handle on the parts right now, we're gonna move into the distal convoluted tubule. So we had a proximal convoluted tubule, so the nearer part, the earlier part, that was all twisty. Distal convoluted tubule is gonna be near the end. Distal means farther, so we're farther along the nephron, okay? So we're moving up here, okay? So this is our distal convoluted tubule, right? So we're zooming in. Our filtrate was in the loop of Henle or the nephron loop before. We're going through the ascending limb. Now we're in this distal tubule or the distal convoluted tubule, okay? So the function here is gonna be some more reabsorption and secretion in order to make adjustments to the ionic contents of the urine. So basically what solutes, what electrolytes are in there. So we're gonna do a little more fiddling here in the distal convoluted tubule. Okay. So we're gonna have both secretion and reabsorption happening here. But a difference from the proximal tubule is that now that we're farther along, now that we're in the distal tubule, this is gonna be more controlled. In the proximal tubule, there's gonna be lots and lots of reabsorption and some secretion going on. It's relatively uncontrolled. As we move into the end of the nephron, uh, this is more minor adjustments. We're gonna control it uh, using different hormones, basically. Okay, oh, I'm gonna go back one bit. So what I do wanna point out to you here about the distal tubule. So note this little purple spot. So this purple spot is where we see the distal tubule coming up near to our afferent and efferent arterial and that glomerulus. So we have a point where all of these things are kind of brushing past each other. Now, there are actually some important cell types that do some important regulatory things in this location. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this specific location, okay? Okay, so this is called the juxtaglomerular complex. So I'm gonna orient you to what we're looking at here because the picture's a little different. So here we have the afferent arterial coming in, okay? We're moving through the glomerulus. So this capillary bed here is the glomerulus then going out through the efferent arterial, right? So this structure was our renal corpuscle, okay? This was our proximal convoluted tubule. So not drawn on here is the rest of the proximal tubule or the nephron loop, which would dip down into the medulla. What we can see is that distal convoluted tubule coming up next to these structures from the beginning. Okay, so the juxtaglomerular complex uh, is located in the region of the vascular pole. All that means is that we're coming up back next to the vasculature, so essentially these arterioles that went into the renal corpuscle, right? So we have the beginning of the blood flow touching the end, essentially, of the nephron, okay? So we have a couple of different cell types that we'd want to pay attention to here. Um, one particular one are these macula densa cells. So you can see here the macula densa cells, part of the distal convoluted tubule, right? But they're right next to the arterioles coming in and going out of the renal corpuscle, okay? So these macula densa cells are gonna help us regulate the filtration rate. So we're gonna see some feedback mechanisms. So we're gonna be able to essentially influence how much blood flow, what this uh, renal corpuscle is doing based on what we see in the filtrate, aka the eventual urine 
at the end of the nephron. Okay, so that's the macula densa cells. We also have these cells sort of uh, inside the sort of triangle here that we're forming. These are our uh, juxtaglomerular cells. If we're talking about the ones kind of lining the arterioles or our mesangial cells, if we're talking about the ones that are uh, all kind of in between filling in the triangle. Okay. So macula densa cells, honestly, I think are, are kind of the most important from an understanding the nephron perspective because they're part of our feedback mechanism. But our mesangial cells and our juxtaglomerular cells are going to be important in terms of your body and how it functions uh, because they're going to be producing hormones, uh, specifically renin. We'll talk about kind of at the end of the unit, its role in regulating blood pressure and erythropoietin, which we've talked about before, because this was uh, basically what tells your body to produce more red blood cells. Okay. So that's uh, coming from these structures. Okay. So those are part of the distal convoluted tubule or right next to the distal convoluted tubule in that juxtaglomerular complex. We're going to continue following that filtrate. So we were here in our distal convoluted tubule. Now we're moving to a collecting duct. Okay. So here we see that collecting duct. We're moving that fluid through. Okay. You have a little bit of reabsorption here under the control of antidiuretic hormone, ADH. And then we're gonna have the collecting duct combining what we're gonna now call urine from many different nephrons, okay? So there's not just one nephron, there are a lot of them all together. And they actually are positioned a little differently uh, relative to the cortex and the medulla. The one we're focusing on is the conceptually most important for us to understand. So we're gonna look at ones that are positioned this way, but if you move forward and think a lot about kidneys, you'll see variation, okay? okay. So our urine is continuing down that collecting duct and now we're gonna trace it out of the body, okay? So we were having that collecting duct actually going through the medulla. So we see this coming out the renal pyramid. We're gonna go through the renal papilla the papilla being like a little hole, essentially, at the end of the renal pyramid, okay? Now, we're in an area called a minor calyx. So the minor calyx is corresponding to our renal pyramid. It's just now a tube where we have the urine, the base here. Minor calyces, that's just plural, will join into a major calyx, so a bigger one after we have several of these come together. So we're moving through the major calyx there and into the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis is this whole collecting area in the center. Okay. And then we're gonna go out of this hilum area, which is referring just to the center of the kidney rather than to the center uh, sort of collecting tube here, all that merging of the urine, all right? So we're moving from the renal pelvis out the hilum, which would include this blood flow. And we're gonna move into the ureter, okay? So here you see it moving through the ureter. This is our urine going through the ureter, okay? So next we're gonna talk about micturition, basically urination and control of the micturition reflux, okay? So we're gonna think about micturition just as being urination. So here we see the ureters coming down, okay? So we formed the urine in the renal tubules, which is just another word essentially uh, for the nephron and its tubules, that proximal tubule and the distal tubule, okay? That fluid drained through the renal papilla into the minor calyx, the major calyx, the renal pelvis, ultimately into these ureters, which is where we're picking it back up now. The ureters lead you into your bladder, and the bladder stores the urine until you're ready to excrete it, aka until you're ready to pee, urinate, micturate, okay? So we're exiting the kidney at the area of the hilum or helum, okay? Going down the ureter, 
extending into the urinary bladder, okay? Uh, the ureters enter the urinary bladder on the posterior and sort of inferior side of it. Hopefully you'll see that in lab, okay? So the entrance to the urinary bladder where those ureters link up are called the ureteral openings in the trigone area, okay? So the trigone area here is this triangle and the ureteral openings are where the ureters joined in. So you can see that's back, posterior and inferior bottom kind of side here, okay? All right. In terms of location in the body, uh, there are a couple different things you'd wanna pay attention to in a typical male or female patient, okay? Uh, and we're just talking biologically in terms of reproductive structures there, okay? So here we see the base of the urinary bladder uh, in this typical male patient located between the rectum, so the end of our gastrointestinal system, so where the food is going and where you're pooping, right? And the synthesis pubis, so that bone at the front where we have our two hip bones, our two pelvic bones uh, centering, okay? It's coming together, joining, forming a joint. In females, we're going to pay a little more attention. We have a different number of organs is basically what I'm saying here, okay? So you still have a rectum at the back. The bladder is still in the front. The base of the bladder is going to be anterior to the uterus, so to this other reproductive structure, and the vagina, which is a canal leading from the uterus, okay? So you can see the bladder and the urethra, its own opening, this whole structure located in front of anterior to all the other structures here. So if you were looking at what's on either side of the bladder in a female patient, you'd see the symphysis pubis on one side and then the uterus on the other side, okay? All right. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the layers of the bladder. So the bladder is mainly made of muscle. Uh, the muscle of the bladder is called the detrusor muscle, okay? We also have some little small smooth muscles uh, as we exit the bladder. Okay, so the detrusor muscle, it's like the wall of the bladder. And then as we're leaving the bladder, we're gonna have an internal and external sphincter, okay? Sphincter is gonna contract, it's like a circle muscle. So when it contracts, it gets smaller, the circle gets smaller. So it essentially cuts off urine, stops you from peeing. If it were to relax, it would open, open up the urethra, allowing you to urinate, okay? So those are our urethral sphincters. So the internal one is under involuntary control because it's made up of smooth muscle. So only skeletal muscle is under voluntary control. Smooth muscle is involuntary. So we're passing through that internal urethral sphincter, which is not under your control. We're gonna lead to an external urethral sphincter that is under voluntary control. And this external urethral sphincter uh, is part of something we call the urogenital diaphragm, okay? Which is gonna be like a layer of muscle at the base of your pelvis, essentially. So urogenital, uro for urinary urine, genital, because we're uh, in an area where we also have the external genitalia, so our reproductive system. Um, so some of these structures are kind of mixed, right? So our urogenital diaphragm supports both our urinary structures and our genital structures, our reproductive structures. Okay, so our external urethral sphincter is under your control because it's made of skeletal muscle, um, but you do lose control as you age, uh, spinal cord injuries, any nervous injuries, uh, or diseases that affect the nerves, uh, or diseases that affect any of the pressure is sort of in this region uh, can affect your control of this sphincter. And cool thing is infants actually need to learn to control this sphincter, just like they need to learn to control, you know, their arms and legs and figure out where they're going, right? So the structure for eliminating urine from your body after it's in the bladder, so bladder to the outside world is called the urethra, uh, slightly different in females and males. Oh. Our picture is on the next slide. 
um, in females. This is going to be like three to five centimeters in length. Uh, the external urethral orifice is near the anterior wall of the vagina, um, but it's actually its own separate hole, right? So in a patient, you'd actually be able to see this separately. This is a common misconception that I see sometimes on TikTok, right? <laughs> Got two holes there. So external urethral orifice, anterior to the vagina. In males, uh, much longer, 18 to 20 centimeters in length, potentially. And we're going to subdivide it in males because in males, the urethra has to cross through several different structures. So we're going to have a prostatic urethra as it passes through the prostate, a membranous urethra as it goes through the urogenital diaphragm, and then a spongy urethra, also called the penile urethra, as it extends through the penis, finally to the external urethral orifice. Okay. So here we can see these structures. Let's find them. Okay. So here we see the structure in a male. So we're going from our urinary bladder, okay? So here would be our prostatic urethra. This sort of walnut-sized structure is the prostate gland. So prostatic urethra, membranous urethra as we go through that urogenital diaphragm. And the external urethral sphincter, remember, is part of the skeletal muscle in that urogenital diaphragm. Actually, fun fact, uh, the urogenital diaphragm is what you're trying to contract when you do like kegels, okay? And then we're going into our penile urethra here or our spongy urethra as we go through the external genitalia leading us to the external urethral orifice, okay? In females, the urethra is much shorter, right? So we see it leaving the bladder. Here's our internal urethral sphincter under involuntary control, short way until we get to the urogenital diaphragm, external urethral sphincter is there, then we're leaving the body, okay? So we can see that that's kind of anterior here to the vagina. So here's our uterus, vagina, then near the anterior wall here, we have the urethra coming out, okay? Cool, all right. So here you just have some, some more structures uh, zoomed in on some of those male structures there. So when we're talking about urination and the micturition reflex, um, we're kind of talking about like when you feel like you need to pee, okay? So your bladder can only contain so much, okay? Usually the first urge to urinate, so when you start to feel like you have to pee, is gonna be when your bladder fills to about 200 milliliters. So that's like a little less than a soda can of fluid, right? Greater than that 200 milliliters is gonna cause your internal urethral sphincter to open. So that's involuntary, right? So this is gonna relax and open up, right? So essentially the urine is gonna to start to push forward here. You're not going to necessarily pee yet because you have still have the external urethral sphincter. So the external urethral sphincter is under your voluntary control. So you are still holding this urogenital diaphragm tight, holding that external urethral sphincter tight, even though the internal urethral sphincter is open. However, there's only so much pressure that the external urethral sphincter can hold. Uh, so between 500 and 800 milliliters, uh, even that external urethral sphincter can open potentially uh, without your consent, right? Uh, so you can actually, if you have too much uh, urine building up in your bladder, pee yourself basically, okay? But under your control usually because hopefully you don't let it get that far. I will say bladders uh, are different sizes and can contain different amounts. Uh, I had a friend who gave birth recently and they measured how much she peed out as part of that process. And they were very, very alarmed. It was, it was a lot more than this. It was like a liter and a half or something TMI, but, uh, there is variation here a little bit. Okay. So if we're thinking about control of the process of urination, control of micturition, uh, we can actually think about a lot of pathways. Okay, so first we wanna think about the muscle of the bladder, okay? So the muscle here, our detrusor muscle, making up the wall of the bladder, 
we have gap junctions between a bunch of smooth muscle cells actually, okay? So these smooth muscle cells are innervated by the parasympathetic neurons. So that's that rest and digest portion of our autonomic nervous system. And parasympathetic neurons, we learned in ANP1, uh, release acetylcholine into cholinergic receptors for that choline, right? Uh, specifically, the ones here are muscarinic cholinergic receptors. Okay. Next, we're thinking about the sphincters around the urethra, okay? So here we have our internal urethral sphincter made of smooth muscle and the external urethral sphincter made of skeletal muscle, okay? Now your body can sense basically uh, how much fluid is building up. It does that through a series of stretch receptors in the bladder, okay? So we have stretch receptors in the bladder that sense when that bladder is getting bigger, getting stretched out, and they send back information uh, to the S2 to S4 regions of the spinal cord. S2 and S4 are just referring to levels of your sacrum. Remember, the sacrum is made up of fused vertebrae, okay? So the neurons coming from the sacrum normally inhibit parasympathetic innervation to the detrusor muscle. So what we're saying there is usually these nerves, right, that will eventually receive stretch information about the bladder are stopping the detrusor muscle, so stopping the walls of the bladder from reacting. So they're basically usually stopping you from peeing, stopping this detrusor muscle from contracting, okay? Now, then we're gonna have our somatic neurons to the external urethral sphincter stimulated, usually, okay, normally. Now, this is called the guarding reflex when we have this situation, okay? So this is gonna prevent you from emptying your bladder. So prevent you from pleading, okay? But when you stretch the bladder out too big, when you have too much stuff in there, too much urine in there, you really need to pee, right? So those stretch receptors are sending information back to the spinal cord, okay? So it's passing up through your spinal cord all the way up to your brainstem to the pons. The pons has a micturition center basically a peeing center um, that tells you whether you have to pee or not, uh, which is going to be called the voiding reflex, at least in this terminology here. Okay. So if your bladder is too stretched out, the neurons connected to those stretch receptors send signal up to your brainstem that then sends a signal back to your bladder through parasympathetic neurons, causing that detrusor muscle to start to contract. This actually happens rhythmically, like kind of in pulses, okay? So your bladder is then gonna contract, okay? And at the same time, the sympathetic innervation to your internal urethral sphincter is causing it to relax, okay? So that's that bit from the previous slide where we said about 200 milliliters is gonna cause that internal urethral sphincter to open, okay? So that's when you feel like you need to pee, Right? So that's the micturition reflex when you feel like you need to plea and you are just going to control it until you have an opportunity to go to the bathroom with that external urethral sphincter that is under your control because it's made of skeletal muscle. Okay, so the level to which I really want you to know this uh, is kind of just like the, the steps of the different type of muscle. Okay, so detrusor muscle in the wall of the bladder. We got some stretch receptors, right? Sending signal up. We open an internal urethral sphincter involuntarily, hold it with our external urethral sphincter until we actually want to go. Okay. So I know there's a lot of information here, um, but focus on the parts that have been mentioned on the previous slides. Okay. There's a lot of stuff that calls back. Uh, so if you move forward, as you start to think about dealing with patients, uh, you'd want to potentially refer back to this, um, but focus on the key terms that are in the rest of these slides as you think about this process. Okay. So final bit, a little bit on age-related problems. Uh, so as you age, your nephrons actually decrease in number, okay? The rate at which the glomerulus filters your blood actually declines, okay? You're gonna have reduced sensitivity to some of the hormones 
that control basically the volume of your urine, the volume of fluid. Um, so this is going to result in frequent urination because you're not essentially like reabsorbing as much. And then also we can have problems with these structures related to the bladder and urethra. So problems with micturition would include those sphincters losing muscle tone. So they're not strong enough. They don't have enough like kind of automatic clenching, automatic clumping down. Okay. So that can lead to incontinence, which is peeing when you don't want to and didn't try to. Um, and another thing that we can see is urinary retention. So like not peeing uh, can lead to infections. Okay. So these are all some different problems that you might see in older patients or as you, your family, your friends age. Okay. Which is part of why we need to get the basics down in this course of your urinary system so that you can start in the future to think about and understand what's going on when stuff goes wrong. So that's when we're going to leave it for today. So we'll be talking about uh, hemoglobin and how it carries oxygen on Friday. So finishing up our respiratory system stuff. And then essentially after spring break, we'll be coming back to some of these things. So take care uh, and have a great rest of the free day or at least biology free day. Take care. All right, and I will end this. Do, 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 do. Do, do.